Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is our uh, second installment of the Economic Liberty Lecture Series uh, for the spring 2013 semester. I'm Bart Frazier. I'm program director here at the Future Freedom Foundation, and we're pleased to have you. Um, like I said, this is our, our second installment. Our first was with Timur Karan last month. We're pleased to have Stephen Landsberg this evening. Uh, and upcoming, we have David Primo, which is going to be in this room Monday, April 1st. Uh, I'd like to let you know about some other events that FFF is hosting uh, over the next several months. Um, we are going to be hosting an event with Pete Betke. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, GMU economist Peter Betke. He recently published a book, Living Economics, and we are going to be hosting a book event for him down in the Arlington campus at Founders Hall. Uh, it's going to be on his book, Living Economics. Uh, we're going to have a panel uh, with FFF Vice President Sheldon Richmond and GMU economist Chris Coyne commenting. That will be on March 27th. There's going to be a 6 p.m. social, and again, that's going to be in Founders Hall. Um, also, uh, uh, Jacob Hornberger, president of the foundation, is hosting an informal seminar on law and economics. Uh, that is here. Uh, at GMU. Um, this particular one is going to be at Hub Room 3 on Monday, March 18th. Uh, the topic uh, for this lecture is going to be Economic Liberty in the Constitution. It's open to all students. Uh, anybody can come, so please attend if you, if you feel uh, inclined to do so. And also we have a, a social at Brian's Grill per usual this evening. Uh, after Q&A, uh, we're just going to retire over to Brian's um, and please start your own tab. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Cole, and thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cole Reddick, and I'm the Vice President of the GMU Economic Society. The Econ Society is a student group, or, uh, a student group committed to the personal, professional, and academic development of all students interested in the study of economics. If you'd like to learn more about the Economic Society, come talk to, talk to me or any of the officers after the event. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Stephen E. Landsberg. Dr. Landsberg received a PhD in mathematics from the University of Chicago in 1979 and is currently a professor of economics at the University of Rochester. He's the author of The Armchair Economist, Fair Play, More Sex is Safer Sex, and The Big Questions. Known for his diverse interests, Professor Landsberg has published over 30 articles in mathematics, economics, and philosophy. His current research is in the area of quantum game theory. Please welcome Steve Landsberg. Thanks. D did you all get the pizza? <laughs> but it's, um, there's an economics lesson right there. Um, when you're eating pizza, the uh, economics lesson that comes to mind is that it's possible to have too much of a good thing. Uh, in fact, when you're thinking about what's good and bad in life, figuring out what's good and what's bad is usually the easy part. The hard part is figuring out when you've got too much of the good thing. The hard part is figuring out when to stop. Should I have a slice of pizza? That's easy. Should I have a third slice? That's a little harder. We face that in our personal lives. We face it in our uh, broader society and the political decisions we make. Uh, should we have a fire department? Yeah, we probably should. Should we have a bigger fire department? That's a harder question. How do you know when the fire department is big enough? You can have too much of a good thing. You can also have too little of a bad thing. Take, um, if I can figure out where the arrows are on here, take pollution, for example. We all agree that pollution is a bad thing. We also all agree, I think, when we stop to think about it, that the right amount of pollution is not zero. We don't want to live in a world with zero pollution because a world with zero pollution is a world without modern travel and without modern heat and without modern buildings and without computers and without all of the other things that we enjoy for which we are willing to live with a little bit of pollution. So once you've observed that the right amount of pollution is not zero, then you have to face the question of whether the amount we've got is too much or too little. It's not immediately obvious. Would we be happier in a world with more pollution or a world with less? 
It's not immediately obvious, but I'm pretty sure I know the answer. I'm pretty sure that the world has too much pollution. I'm pretty sure we would be happier if we lived in a world with less pollution. And the reason I believe that is because the people who make decisions about how much to pollute are by and large not the same people who have to live with the consequences of that pollution. They decide to put the smoke in the air and somebody else has to breathe that smoke. And economic theory tells me that when decision makers don't have to live with the costs of their actions, they generally do too much of the bad things. And conversely, when they don't have to live or when they don't reap the benefits of their actions, they do too little of the good things. That's why we have too few people out there on the quad picking up trash. Okay? Some people like to go out and do that a little bit. They find it fun, but they don't do as much of it as the rest of us would like them to do, and they don't because most of the benefits of their activity accrue to people other than themselves. So there's a powerful idea that comes from economics. It's a simple idea. It's one that most people, even if they haven't studied economics, have very little trouble buying into. In our economics classes, we actually, we don't just assert this, we prove it. We prove it using graphs with uh, uh, marginal social costs and, and uh, marginal private costs and marginal social benefits and marginal private benefits. Uh, but again, you don't need to have taken an economics class to find the conclusion plausible. I'll say it again, when people don't have to live with the consequences of their decisions, they do too much of the bad stuff too little of the good stuff. Now, when you've got a powerful principle like that, that you believe is right, uh, a good thing to do next is to start looking for other places to apply that principle. So we applied it to pollution. Let's apply it to something else. Let's apply it to the question of whether the world has too much or too little casual sex. Does the world have too much or too little casual sex? Well, let's think about the consequences of having casual sex and what, to the extent to which those consequences fall upon the decision makers. For starters, for starters, let's, let's do an example. Let's suppose that you are a very reckless, promiscuous person who's had a lot of partners, hasn't taken a lot of precautions, uh, and has not been terribly smart about the, uh, the, the way that you've led your sex life. When I say, suppose you are a very promiscuous, reckless person, I want to make it clear I'm not looking at any particular person in the audience. This is some generic you I'm talking about. But suppose you are that generic you. You're very promiscuous. You're very reckless. You go out tonight, and you find yourself a new partner. That partner is at risk and is at risk in a way that he or she is unaware of. Okay? Now, if they were aware, of your past behavior. There would not be a social problem here. They'd be facing a risk. They would decide for themselves whether that risk is worth taking. There'd be no reason for anybody else to second guess that. Okay? We, we are libertarians. We believe that, that, that people should be allowed to take the risks they want to take. The problem is that you can't tell by looking who's who. Okay? You can't tell by looking who has had the very active past sex life. Maybe someday technology will solve that problem for us. Maybe someday you'll take your new partner home and there on their thigh will be an embedded monitor that says this site has been accessed 357 times. <laughs> but until that day arrives, okay, you're facing this uncertainty, you're facing this lack of knowledge, and the promiscuous person who takes a new partner is putting that person at a risk they're unaware of that's what we call in our economics classes an externality, or when I'm talking to non-economists, I sometimes call it a spillover cost. What it means is that people like this have too many partners, that the world would be a better place if they chose to have fewer. This is a polluter. This is somebody who goes out and pollutes the partner pool in which everybody else is fishing, makes the, the act of looking for partners riskier for everybody else than it needs to be. That's a bad thing, and the important thing is that he does not live with the consequences of his own actions. 
He does not live with the consequences of his own actions. They fall on other people, and that's how I know he does too much of it. He takes too many new partners. Nobody ever seems to find that surprising when I give them that analysis. But now let's take the exact same logic and look at the flip side of it. Instead of supposing that you're, you're this very res reckless, promiscuous person, let's suppose you're a very cautious person, somebody who's had very few partners and has been very careful in the way you've had those partners. If you go out tonight and find yourself a new partner, the partner who goes home with you is having safer sex than they realize. You are, it's not visible to them how safe you are. They're, going, they're choosing to go home with you. Okay? There are some people who occasionally choose not to go home with you because they think you are of average uh, risk when in fact you're of less than average risk. When you take a new partner, you make the world a safer place. You make the world a safer place in a way that other people can't observe so they can't adjust their own behavior to it. You see, if other people could tell how safe you were, again, there'd be no social problem here because you would be rewarded for your cautiousness. You'd be rewarded for your cautiousness by being the most popular person on the block. Okay? Everybody would want to go out with you because you're known to be safe. But you don't get those rewards because your safety is not visible. Therefore, you're exactly in the position of the person out on the quad picking up the trash and not getting the rewards for it. Therefore, you don't do enough of that. Therefore, if you are this person, you'll make the world a safer place if you go out and find a new partner tonight. They're having safer sex than they realize. You are cleaning up the partner pool in which everybody else is fishing. And that means applying our same principle again, the same principle that told us the world has too much pollution, the same principle that tells us this guy has too many partners, tells us that this guy has too few. And that if we could get him to loosen up and go out tonight and find one more partner, the world would be a happier place. The world would be a happier place. In fact, when the very cautious person, again, let's say it's you, when that very cautious person goes out and gets, gets a new partner, you make the world safer in two ways. I just described one of them. The person who goes home with you is safer than they would be if they went home with somebody else. The other one is a bit more macabre, but it turns out empirically a lot more important, and that's this. If you're the very cautious person, and if you go out tonight and find yourself a new partner, you might have the bad luck to hook up with somebody who's infected. And if you do, there's a good chance you'll get sick. And if you get sick, there's a good chance you'll go home and die. And that's great, because when you die, the virus dies with you. If somebody is going to get infected tonight, I want it to be this guy who's going to go home, waste away for five years and die, rather than this guy who's going to give the virus to 20 other people before he dies. When he goes out and gets the virus, instead of him getting the virus, he's done the world a favor, and it turns out empirically that that's a big one. So because there are these positive externalities, because there are these good spillover benefits, when the cautious person takes a new partner, we know that the world would be a better place. Economics tells us the world would be a better place if we could get those people to take more partners. Now, when I say the world would be a better place, what exactly does that mean? Let's think about it. We want him to have more partners. We want him to have a few more partners. We don't want him to have so many more partners that he turns into a clone of this guy. We just want him to have a few more partners. Here's the number of partners that our cautious person might have. And here's the amount of disease that person's going to spread. Now, there are, after all, when you have a new partner, I just told you two ways in which you're making the world safer, but there are also ways in which you're making the world more dangerous because every single sex act has a chance of spreading the virus. So we've got these conflicting um, uh, forces here. And after a certain point, when you've had enough partners, you start actually creating more disease. So if you look at that graph and you don't know any economics, you're going to say what we would really like is for our cautious person to choose that many partners right there, the number that minimizes the spread of disease. 
not too few and not too many. But if you do know some economics, you know that's wrong because disease is the cost of having sex. And if you know some economics, you know that when you're thinking about the right amount of something, you can't just look at the costs, you gotta also look at the benefits. It turns out that sex has benefits also, benefits which I assume I don't need to explain to college students. And if we put those benefits on our graph here, so the more partners you have, the more joy you are spreading through the world, then what an economist would want you to do is not to minimize disease, but to maximize the gap between benefits and disease, to find the number of partners that maximizes your net contribution to the world, the, the positive of the benefits minus the negative of the cost. That's what an economist would call the welfare maximizing quantity of partners. If you are a monomaniac who cares about nothing but stopping disease, you want people to have this many partners. If you are a sane person who wants to ba uh, balance benefits against cost, you want people to have this much disease. Uh, that many partners, I'm sorry, that many partners. What does economics tell us? Economics tells us that, again, because people don't feel all the benefits of their actions, blah, 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 they have too few partners. What does too few mean? It means they're somewhere to the left of this. Pure economic theory tells me that cautious people have a number of partners somewhere down here, somewhere to the left of that welfare maximizing quantity. We want them to have more. But you might also be interested in the question of whether those cautious people, by and large, are choosing a quantity here or a quantity here. In other words, when you have another partner, if you're that cautious person, are you decreasing the amount of disease or increasing the amount of disease? Are you here? There's no question. You're either here or here. They want me at the microphone. You're either there or there. So another partner would get you closer to the welfare max. That's all the economist cares about. But we're still interested in, in, the, in the subsidiary question of where are you with respect to disease minimization. Now that, it turns out, you can't answer from pure economics. You need a model that incorporates a lot of economics and also a lot of epidemiology. And you need to build a lot of theory into that model, and you need to do a lot of empirical work on that model. It turns out that there is a fellow at Harvard University named Michael Kramer, a great, great economist, who knows a lot of economics, knows a lot of epidemiology, knows a lot about how to work with theory, and knows a lot about how to work with numbers. And he has done the best work we have on this subject. And his estimate is that the typical cautious person is, in fact, falling short not just of the welfare max, but also short of the disease min. So if that person had one more partner, they would improve welfare. They would also reduce the amount of disease. The, uh, in fact, that disease minimization falls at about two and a quarter partners per year. Two and a quarter partners does not mean that you literally have exactly two and a quarter partners every year. It means that you have, on average, nine partners every eight years, if I just did the arithmetic right in my head. Um, uh, or ten, I, I don't know, whatever the arithmetic tells you. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, five partners every four years, that's what it would mean. Um, and three quarters of the population is below that. Three quarters of the adult population averages fewer than two, or two and a quarter partners per year. So three quarters of the population, if they took one more partner tonight, would not only increase welfare, they would also, they would do it by reducing the amount of disease. All right, how do you get them to do that? How do we get people to behave better? Well. Standard economic theory tells us that when we have polluters who pollute the world too much because they don't feel the consequences of their actions, the solution is to make them feel the consequences of their actions by taxing them for polluting. Now, uh, to an audience of committed libertarians, I should, I should um, qualify that a bit. Uh, we believe we could make the world a better place in terms of cost-benefit analysis if we taxed those polluters. 
Perhaps we would do so at the cost of a certain amount of liberty. Some of us, uh, different among, ones among us are gonna take different attitudes as to whether that's uh, a trade-off we're willing to make. I just wanna look at this from the pure economic point of view. From the pure economic point of view, there's no question you wanna be taxing those polluters. From the pure economic point of view, there's no question you wanna be rewarding, subsidizing those people who pick up trash from the park. What that means in this context is that if we could, we would like to tax the very promiscuous people every time they take a new partner, and we would like to subsidize the very cautious people every time they take a new partner. Well, how do you do that? Um, the problem is, maybe you can prove you had a new partner last night, but I can't tell whether you're very promiscuous or very cautious, so I don't know whether to tax you or subsidize you. Um, the uh, standard solution to that in economic theory is to find a reward that appeals only to the people you're trying to encourage. Find a reward that only the unpromiscuous care about. What could that reward be? I don't know, maybe a library card. Um, because surely the promiscuous people are too busy to go to the library. Um, so maybe a library card, you know, you bring in, your, bring in your proof that you had a new partner last night, we'll give you a library card. Uh, or a little less frivolously, subsidized condoms or free condoms. Because contrary to what your intuition might tell you, the people who value condoms the most are the least promiscuous people. And the reason for that is the more promiscuous you are, the more likely you are to already be infected with something. And the more likely you are to already be infected with something, the less value you're gonna place on a condom. At the extreme, if you know you're infected and if you're completely selfish, you're not gonna value condoms at all. The people who are, who know they're not infected or are almost sure they're not infected, they're the ones who want the condoms. So if we give out free condoms, we're encouraging those people, that's a good thing. A lot of people will tell you that when it comes to fighting HIV, free condoms have an upside and a downside. The upside, is that they directly prevent the spread of disease, and the downside is they encourage more sex. Well, what I'm saying is that that's not an upside and a downside, that's two upsides. The first upside is you directly prevent the spread of disease, and the second upside is you encourage more sex by that three quarters of the population who, when they have more sex, slow down the spread of diseases, and most particularly HIV. Um, so uh, the problem with that proposal, unfortunately, is that condoms are pretty cheap to begin with, and so free condoms are not really all that much of a lure. But uh, that's, the, that's the kind of direction in which you would want to be thinking if you wanted to, to solve this problem. Uh, unfortunately, I have no more to say. I have no better ideas to offer. Maybe something will come up in the question period. But um, uh, the... Uh, I go back to the idea that when you've got a principle this powerful, a principle that everybody buys into and yet which yields results that nobody expected, you want to continue to look for other places where you can apply that principle. So let's take one more. Let's move away from sex to the closely related problem of reproduction. Let's ask whether the world has too many or too few people. Is the world over or underpopulated? Is the world over or underpopulated? When you ask that question, not in this crowd, I'm sure, but in many crowds, there's always somebody who will pop up to say something stupid like, well, there's a limit to the number of people the Earth can support. And you know that that's the person who is not serious. Because we all know there's a limit to the number of people the earth can support. That's another way of saying that there's such a thing as too many people. And we all know that there's such a thing as too many people, just like we all know there's such a thing as too much pollution, such a thing as too, too much sex, such a thing as too much pizza. The question is not, is there such a thing as too many people? The question is, do we currently have too many or too few? And to observe that there's such a thing as too many is to contribute absolutely nothing to that discussion and in fact to announce that you're not interested in participating in that discussion. So let's be more serious than that person and ask whether the world currently has too many or too few people. 
You cannot address a question like that without looking at the incentives faced by the decision makers. And in this case, the decision makers are the parents and the potential parents who are deciding whether to have another child. So let's look at the cost-benefit analysis that those parents do. But before we do that, let's make sure that we separate what we'll call the private costs and benefits, the ones that are felt by the parents themselves from the spillover costs and benefits, the ones that spill over outside the family. The private costs and benefits are the ones that nobody else has any reason to care about. If, 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 if some family decides that they're going to have another child and it's going to cost them $10,000 a year to send that kid to school and it's going to cost them this and that and the other thing, as long as they're paying those costs, that's up to them. That's a decision they can make for themselves. Where we have a social problem is when the costs start to spill over on the rest of us. So I want to separate private costs from spillover costs so that we can choose to ignore the private costs when we think about the social aspects of this. But let's start with those private costs. When you decide to have another kid, what are some of the costs of that? Uh, uh, benefits, I'm sorry, I'm starting with the benefits at the top. The main one is love, okay? Most of us love our kids. Most of us get some love back from our kids. Most of us value that. Okay? And that's a big, big component of why people choose to have children. Love from the parents to the kids, love from the kids to the parents. That's a big one. Weighed against that are the costs of having a child. When you have a child, you got to feed the child. you got to clothe the child. You're sitting up late nights with that child, and, and um, uh, when the child is sick, you're giving up lots of sleep, you're giving up lots of energy, you're giving up lots of time when you could have earned more money. When the kid gets a little older, you're bailing him out of jail. Uh, those are all costs, again, that are felt by the parents. The parents decided to have this kid. So there's no reason you and I should care. We care when things start to spill over. So let's look at the spillovers. Let's start with the spillover benefits. Your kid is likely to love a lot of people besides you and be loved by a lot of people besides you. Chances are you at some point in your life have been loved or at least liked by somebody other than your parents. And that is a little measure of joy that you've brought to the world that your parents probably were not thinking about when they decided they wanted to have another child. That's a spillover benefit. That by itself is a reason to wish your parents had had more children, to think maybe they stopped too soon for the same reason the guy out picking up trash in the park stops too soon. The benefits are spilling over on other people. I haven't proved anything, of course, because we're going to have to compare this to costs, but let's, let's finish uh, um, filling in the benefits first. Friendship. Uh, your kids make friends as they go through life, and people value their friendship. When I say make friends, that's everything from best friends forever on the one hand to the stranger they smiled at on the street and, and brightened their day a little bit with a, with, a, uh, with, with a gesture of friendship or maybe they stopped and helped somebody fix a flat tire. All of those things are advantages that your children bring to the world that you didn't account for. Diversity. Every child born into the world increases the world's stock of diversity and you need critical masses which means you need large populations to get any kind of unusual preference going. The reason there are Ethiopian restaurants, the reason there are chamber orchestras, the reason there is paragliding is because the world population is so large that there are enough people to support those activities. There are seven billion people in the world. You might think that's all we need to support just about anything, but you know something? Out of seven billion, we got, I think, about 40 here in this room tonight. And if there had been half as many, nobody could have afforded to bring me here. So uh, the, uh, we, we need that kind of population critical mass in order to get that kind of diversity. It's another advantage of bringing another kid into the world. And then the big one. Ideas. Every child born into the world has ideas and other people are able to copy those ideas and that is how the world progresses. That's why we don't live the way people lived in the year 1340. 
we, we, the world gets better and better and better and richer and richer and richer almost entirely because we copy each other's ideas. And every new child born into the world is a child who has more ideas that other people can copy. When I say ideas, and when I talk about the progress that we have due to ideas, everybody always thinks about the great feats of engineering, our cell phones, our iPhones, the internet, all these things, ideas that came from somebody else's kids. But it's more than just that engineering, it's also the farmer who thinks of a new method of crop rotation that all the other farmers can, can copy. Or the business person who invents a new method of inventory management, like just-in-time inventory management, an idea which has done more to alleviate the difficulties of poverty in this country than any idea that has ever come from a politician on either side of the aisle. Um, that single idea that somebody else's kid had has improved life for tens of millions of the poorest Americans. You can fly to Tokyo partly because somebody figured out how to build an airplane and partly because somebody else figured out how to insure it. We needed both those people in order to make that happen. You have a personal computer on your desk partly because somebody said, hey, I wonder if we can make computer chips out of silicon and partly because somebody else said, hey, I wonder if we can finance startup companies with junk bonds. And you needed both those things to make the computer revolution happen. In fact, if you want to ask what's the relative importance of those two things, one rough and ready way to do it is to follow the money. By that rough and ready measure, it's pretty much a tie. At the dawn of the computer revolution, in the early 1980s, Microsoft was making about $600 million a year. Michael Milken, the junk bond king, was also making about $600 million a year, okay? which to a rough approximation tells us that they were contributing approximately the same amount to social value. So ideas matter enormously. They matter so much I'm going to put it in a bigger font. Um, that's a huge spillover benefit of having another child. But again, counting benefits doesn't prove anything. We got to weigh this stuff against costs. What are the costs of bringing another child into the world? The big one that everyone thinks of is resource consumption. Every kid that gets born eats food, burns gas, takes up space. Is that a spillover effect? Does that affect people outside your own family? I'm not sure. It depends on where you get those resources. There are a lot of ways to get those resources that don't spill over on other people. If you grow an apple tree and eat the apples, that doesn't hurt anybody. The apple tree wouldn't have been there if you hadn't grown it. If you grow an apple tree and then trade those apples for some fish, that doesn't hurt anybody as long as the trade was voluntary, as long as the fish seller was happy to make the trade. We get a lot of our resources that way. We create them ourselves, or we create some unrelated thing and then trade. Okay? Those are not costs. Those are not hurting anyone. There's another place that we get a tremendous amount of our resources that a lot of us don't give enough credit to, and that is we get them from our parents. Some of us get them directly in the form of gifts, gifts while we're alive or inheritances, gifts while they're alive, inheritances after they're dead, but we also get them in terms of all those late nights that they sat up with us, all the education they gave us, all the attention they gave us, all the stories they read to us, all the values they instilled in us. We get that from our parents. That's a huge cost. You know who it, com you know who it comes at the expense of? Not your neighbors, but your brothers and sisters. That's who all that time is getting taken away from. If you have an older brother, the day you were born was the worst day of that older brother's life. Okay? It took half the inheritance, half the gifts, half the parental attention, okay? half the time spent, half the money spent. And here's the point. Your parents who loved that older brother thought you were worth it. So who's to second guess them? As long as they loved the older brother and were fully accounting for 
his concerns and said, wow, this is really going to hurt that older kid, but it's still worth it. This younger kid, we still want him so much, it's still worth it. That's all private. Who's to second guess that? So when we look at resource consumption and we ask whether that's a private cost or a spillover cost, I think an awful lot of it goes perhaps in the private category. Or to put this another way, so many people have this idea that if I had never been born, there'd be a little bit more food and a little bit more fuel for everybody else. It's not true. If I'd never been born, what there would be is a whole lot more food and fuel for those two people, my sisters. If I'd never been born, they'd have a whole lot more. You guys, you'd be exactly where you are now. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have more or less. So um, when we look again at that resource consumption and ask what box it goes in, I think an awful lot of it goes in the private box. Again, my parents cared about my sisters. I took a lot away from my sisters by being around here, but my parents, acting as my sister's agent, decided I was worth it. Who are you to care? Now, uh, that's not to say that there are no spillover costs of having a child. Uh, here are three that come to mind. If your child grows up and becomes a thief, uh, that imposes costs on other people. Most of us don't grow up to be thieves, putting aside that notebook you stole in seventh grade. Uh, if you make war on your neighbors, um, that imposes a cost on other people that your parents probably didn't account for. That's a spillover cost. We want to account for that. Most of us don't become warriors. If you become a major polluter, you're imposing costs on other people who might very well wish you had never been born. Uh, again, most of us are not in that category. Uh, another one that I think it's only fair to include here is that if you go on public assistance, you are imposing costs on other people who might not want to pay those costs and who might think that it would have been better for them if you hadn't been born. That's a legitimate spillover cost of your being around here. So there are spillover costs of your existence. There are also spillover benefits. To know whether we have too many or too few children, we got to ask which is bigger. I don't know. I don't know which is bigger, but I got a pretty strong guess. My strong guess is that the power of those ideas is so enormous. The amount you contribute through the world by going through life and having ideas all the time which other people can look at, they learn from your bad ideas too. You never even have to have a good idea to make the world a better place. All you gotta do is have a bad idea and let people say, wow, I'm not gonna do that. Every little idea you have, every big idea you have, makes the rest of the world a richer place. That's huge. And because it's so huge, I believe it probably dwarfs what's in the cost box there. Have I proved that? Absolutely not. I have no idea how to measure most of this stuff. Okay? But there's my guess. What I want to sell to you, though, is not a conclusion, but a way of thinking. What I want to convince you of is that regardless of what conclusion you reach, this is the only productive way to think about this question. When a child is born, what are the spillover costs? What are the spillover benefits? Which, which are bigger? If the spillover benefits are bigger, we have too few people. If the spillover costs are bigger, we have too many. Let me um, try and say all this in a slightly different way. Here we have two plots of land owned by two different families. They're the same size plots of land, and they're the same size families. The family on the left, they doubled their size in a generation, and they split the land accordingly, and now everybody's living on half as much land per capita as before. The family on the right, they practice zero population growth, generation after generation. They're always the same size family. They always got the same amount of land. Family on the left, another generation goes by. Now everybody's living on a quarter of a lot, and then, and, and then, uh, and then less than that, and then less than that. Eventually, these people are living on postage stamps. These people are living on great big fields. So far, that's not a social problem. That's an opportunity to celebrate diversity. One family decided they would rather be rich, and the other family decided they would rather have a lot of grandchildren. And those are both legitimate choices. Okay. You can keep your descendants richer, or you can have a lot of descendants and both those things are legitimate things to want to do, it's okay for two different families to make two different choices. 
The point where you might start saying that it's not okay is if you believe, for example, that the family on the left is going to look at the family on the right and say, hey, they're pretty rich. Let's go invade them and take their stuff. Okay? That's a spillover. That's when the family on the right has a right to say, hey, maybe you guys had too many children. Okay? We wish you'd had less. But offsetting that is the fact that the family on the right, by virtue of this big population over here, they've got so many more possible friends, so many possible more mates. Again, 7 billion people in the world, you'd think it wouldn't be hard to find a compatible mate, but look how many people spend five years on Match.com before they find them. Okay? They're not easy to find. More people next door means a better chance of finding a mate. Better chance, more people to hire, more people to work for, more people to trade with, more people to partner with, more people to help you start a club, okay, the teapot collecting club that you need 10 people to, to justify having. And every one of those per people is gonna have ideas that the people over there can copy. Somebody over here is gonna invent a better kind of airplane and the people over there are gonna to get to ride it. Okay. So do those people want the people on the left to have had more kids or fewer? There are good reasons for them to wish they'd had fewer and good reasons for them to wish they'd had more. I am guessing that the reasons to wish they had more, in most cases, dwarf the reasons to wish they had had fewer. I have one child, a girl. There she is. Just got married a couple of months ago. Married a fabulous guy. My only child. Why? Because we thought about it. We thought about how much trouble a kid is and how expensive a kid is. And we said, yeah, we want one of those, but we don't want to. That was the decision that was right for us. But somewhere in this world, and the ages are right, maybe somewhere in this room, there is a girl, about my daughter's age, whose life has been permanently impoverished by my failure to have the son who would have someday swept her off her feet. And if I had cared as much about that girl as I care about my own daughter, I would have had that son. My choice to stop after one child was a selfish choice. If I had cared about the rest of the world as much as I cared about my own family, I probably would have had another. Now, I understand selfishness. And I can't completely condemn selfishness. I was selfish myself. What I don't understand is encouraging other people to be selfish, which is the whole point of organizations like Zero Population Growth. I, um, oh, I just threw that one into proof related. <laughs> uh, I, I cannot leave this topic without saying a few words about overcrowding, because that always comes up. People say, but what about overcrowding? What about the fact that we're running out of room on the earth? Well, a lot of people are misinformed about that, and that's because they look at the news, and if, they, when, if you look at the news too much, you get the impression that the world looks like this. But if you actually fly across the country, you discover the truth, which is that the world looks like this. Um, there is a lot of space in the world. I know it seems like there are a lot of people around, a lot of people on Earth. The fact is, you can fit every one of them in the Grand Canyon if you stack them right. <laughs> Literally true. Or, if you don't like that image, take this one that I got from Tom Sowell. Take the state of Texas. Divide it up into lots equal to the size of the average middle class home lot in the United States. Divide the state of Texas into lots equal to the size of the average middle class home lot in the United States put a family of four in each of those homes, and you have just housed the entire world's population. You've just housed the entire world's population. Plus, you can fit all the McDonald's in Oklahoma. Uh, so, the world is not crowded. Some parts of the world are crowded. And sometimes people who live in those places complain about how crowded they are, but it's hard to take them seriously when it's so easy to leave those places. New Yorkers complain about the crowds, but they don't leave New York. Why don't they leave New York? Ask them why they don't leave New York. They say, well, I want the symphonies, I want the shows, I want the good jobs, I want the, the, the culture. 
Where's all that stuff coming from? It's coming from the crowds. It's part of the package. Okay? It's part of the package. And more people like that package than dislike it. You might say, oh, but what about the people who dislike it? And that would be a problem if the whole world were packed full of people. But since it's not, it's not a problem. Anybody who wants to can move to Montana. The fact is, more people move from Montana to New York than move the opposite way. But the important fact is, everybody has the option. The net flow of population is from the countryside to Calcutta, not from Calcutta to the countryside. Um, but anybody who prefers the countryside to Calcutta, nobody stops them from moving there. Why do people get that wrong so much? I'm not sure, but I suspect it's something like this. You're stuck in traffic on a hot summer night. It's really, really easy to remember that the guy in front of you is imposing a cost, that the guy in front of you is making your life worse. Somehow it's harder to remember that the guy who invented car air conditioning is currently making your life a whole lot better. And that if we had cut the population in half, we might have lost either of those people. Um, so I come back to my chart with the ideas and the, and the, and the other uh, calculations. And again, I don't claim to have proved anything definitive here. I can't without measuring stuff, and I don't know how to measure most of this stuff. But I've got a very strong guess which way things go. Should you be interested in that guess? I'm not sure you should. What I hope you'll be interested in is the way of thinking, the way of thinking about spillover costs and benefits as not just a way, but the only way to tell when the world has too much of something and when the world has too little, whether it's sex or people or pollution or anything else. Uh, so I will, um, I will stop there, and I will welcome your questions and your comments, maybe at first on, uh, on, on the stuff we've talked about here, but then if you, if you want to ask anything else at all about pretty much anything, uh, I, I'm happy to talk. Um, so... Uh, Hi. Well, thank you. The, your, is this on? I don't think it is. No, it's not. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you. Uh, great talk. Um, I was thinking of, uh, I noticed you chose a very uncontroversial title. Um, I was thinking of the other thing you do more of, which is better. I think of John Lott's book, More Guns, Less Crime. Um, and I think the same effect is there, that um, you know, you, people don't burgle a house because they don't know whether or not the people inside own a gun. And uh, you could argue that gun control makes it more likely that they're going to burgle a house where a person doesn't have a gun and can defend himself. <clears throat> and, and so in some way, the ignorance of that is, is a benefit to the people in the house, obviously not a benefit to the burglar. I was, I was struck with, by this when, a, a few months ago when people were talking about various um, assault weapon bans and uh, um, assault clip bans and assault, assault appearance bans uh, on guns. Uh, some, some gun rights people, I think, in... Uh, maybe it was Connecticut, I don't know, suggested that these people who felt this way, they, will, they made up signs for them and said, you can put this sign on your, your door which says nobody in this house owns a gun of any kind. Nobody wants those signs. Right, and, and you know, you, they'd be willing to give those signs out for free. Um, so it, it's, uh, there, there's that aspect, it seems to me the, the problem about any sort of a pro, prohibitionary scheme is that we, there are some people who we want to have more guns um, and I'm thinking, you know, some people want, who want to have no guns. Um, I'm thinking of Switzerland where people of a certain age and who are in their right minds are, are required to have a, a gun in their home uh, to serve in the militia, um, but nevertheless they're required to have one that's in working order. Um, and maybe by the same argument you would, if you were going to pass a law that would use, use your, uh, the paradox you mentioned to the most advantage, you'd require people like, uh, um, like the, the Pope to have more sex um, by, the same, uh, by the same token, that would be beneficial to uh, the population as a whole. Uh, th there is, there's a lot to say on that subject. Um, it, it certainly is true um, that on the one hand, uh, I get a, a big external benefit when a lot of my neighbors have guns, especially if the criminals don't know which houses have the guns. Um, 
I, I would like to, in many ways, I would like to live in a town where it is known that 80% of the people have guns, uh, because I, I think that that will deter people from breaking into my house. On the other hand, you know, the offsetting spillover is that is that if my neighbor happens to go crazy one day, uh, I would prefer that he not have a gun than he have a gun. Uh, which of those is bigger is an empirical question, and John Lott's done a lot of very good work on that. A lot of other people have too. Uh, I my guess on that one, and I am not um, well versed in the detailed econometric analysis that John Lott has done. So I I, I do not feel competent. To, to point to specific results and say, I think he got this right, I think he got that wrong. Uh, my guess on that stuff is that I'm probably better off on, on net uh, if, my, if, if a lot of my neighbors have guns. Uh, the concealed carry stuff is, is a little more interesting. Um, uh, um, if, if a lot of people are out there carrying guns on the street, the uh, criminals are less likely to attack me because they think I'm one of the people who might have a gun. On the other hand, um, if you're carrying a gun and the criminal attacks you and you pull your gun um, and he runs away, then the next thing he's gonna do is attack me instead of you. Uh, uh, to some extent, when you pull out your gun on the street there, you're not deterring the criminal so much as uh, sending him to, to rob somebody else. There is some negative spill over there. Again, I don't know for sure which way, uh, 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 which way that goes. Again, I, I certainly, the person to ask, if, if it's between me and John Lott, you should be asking John Lott. Um, and uh, 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 he, uh, he has gotten, I know, some very strong results on the effects of concealed carry stuff. Uh, showing that uh, that there there is a lot of deterrence from that, and that it reduces the amount of crime. I know there are other people who have disputed those things, and again, I am not uh, a careful scholar of that stuff, so I'm I'm going to refrain from commenting on it. Though I may have some priors. Um, with other crime control things, it's a lot more. Um, uh, uh, stuff goes. Um, in different, there's always this, this tension uh, between whether you're deterring crime and whether you are simply sending the criminals next door. Uh, when I put a, um, a burglar alarm on my house, I make crime less profitable, I make crime a little less profitable, and I make it a little less likely that, that, that somebody in this audience is gonna decide to be a criminal. But I also, uh, make it more likely that if there is a criminal, he'll visit my neighbor instead of me. Um, on balance, am I making my neighbor more or less likely to get burglarized? I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I feel sure somebody has looked at that, but I am not familiar with the results on that. Um, when I look at things like car theft, uh, there it becomes a little more obvious. Uh, you put a low jack on your car, you're doing a big favor to your neighbors because nobody can tell which cars has the lo have the low jacks. Uh, everybody know what a low jack is? Uh, it's a, uh, an electronic device that allows the police to, to trace your car and, uh, when it's been stolen, and, and in many cases, they find the criminal. And not only do they find the criminal, but they find the chop shop to which the criminal has taken the car, and therefore they find a lot of other stolen cars as well. You put a low jack on your car, you're doing a huge favor to your neighbors. Um, uh, you are, first of all, making it much more dangerous to steal cars in general, which just deters people from becoming car thieves. Uh, second of all, uh, you're helping the police find these chop shops if your car does get stolen. Uh, that's a huge benefit to your neighbors. On the other hand, if you protect your car with, say, the club, which is this device, you, visible device you put on your steering wheel that makes it impossible for the criminal to steal the car, well, there, certainly, all you're doing is convincing the guy to steal the next car down the line instead of yours. Um, and the next car, guy down the line does not want you to have that club in your car. So I, I think there is a very good case. And again, I'm putting liberty issues aside. I mean, there are all, if you start talking about liberty, you start saying maybe we don't want to have the, maybe we don't want the government to have power to do good things because they might use that power to do bad things. And that's a, that's a legitimate argument. But just focusing on what are the good things the government could do, there's little question in my mind that, that subsidizing low jacks, low jacks should get a huge subsidy and the club should get a huge tax. 
Um, uh, they're, they're, um, so I've, I've, I've gone on uh, at great length there. I'll, I'll give the floor to someone else. Or uh, I'll, I'll let you go in a minute, but while you're, uh, uh, while we're on the subject of crime, I, I will give you my very best argument for uh, the criminalization of drugs and for maintaining the drug war. And that is that I, I think there, there is a certain segment of the population that really enjoys the idea of being a criminal. And if you make drugs illegal, you give them an opportunity to be criminals without actually causing any harm. Um, you know, I, 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 I would much rather have people selling drugs to willing users than going out and hitting people over the head if that's the only way to be a criminal. Um, I think on the same grounds, it might be a good idea to make pizza illegal too. Um, next question. Yeah, would you uh, apply these principles to uh, trade restrictions and immigration controls? Yeah, uh, well, there's a lot to be said there. First of all, uh, you've just added a new wrinkle to the analysis. Because when we do this kind of cost-benefit analysis, and when we are looking at the policies that we are going to recommend to, say, the American government, then you face a philosophical question. Should we be looking at only those costs and benefits that fall on Americans, or should we be looking at the costs and benefits that fall on people all over the world? Which should we care about when we make policy? Should, we care, should the American government, because it represents Americans, care only about Americans? Or should they act as if they care about everybody in the world equally, or perhaps, if not equally, care about other people in the world? What fraction of the amount that they care about Americans? My own opinion on this, which you are welcome to accept or reject as you want, because this is another one of those things I can't prove. But my own strong opinion on this is that I would like to see the American government treat everybody in the world equally and care equally about the costs and benefits that fall on uh, a Nigerian as about the costs and benefits that fall on me. And the reason why I feel that way is that most American policy affects total strangers who live in Nevada, California, Arkansas, Arizona, Alaska, and I don't see any reason I should care more about those total strangers than I care about the total strangers who live in Tokyo or Mexico City or, uh, or Winnipeg. Um, so if we are all agreed that our government should be making policies with a view to the welfare of a whole bunch of people we are never going to meet, then it seems to me to be kind of ugly to say we're only going to care about the total strangers who happen to have born, been born on the right side of some invisible line. Um, I understand caring more about yourself than about strangers. I understand caring more about your family than about strangers. I even care to some extent caring more about your friends than about strangers. But I don't understand caring about one bunch of total strangers more than another bunch of total strangers. And since all, most policy, almost all the effects fall on total strangers anyway, I would like it to account for the whole world. If you're accounting for the whole world, then my God, it's hard to think of a government policy that does more harm than our restrictive immigration policies. Um, uh, requiring people to live in countries where they cannot realize their, not only can't realize their full potential, but can never rise above uh, making $2 an hour. Um, it, is, it is horrible, it is indefensible, it is appalling. But if you are that person who says, no, wait a minute, this is the American government. Let's look at the, um, uh, the American government is charged with the responsibility to look out for the good of Americans. Well, it turns out that fortunately, I don't have to rethink my policy recommendation because even if you focus only on Americans, the benefits of immigration quite clearly outweigh the costs of immigration. Every new immigrant, just like every one of those new children there, is a potential partner, a potential friend, a potential employee, a potential employer, a potential um, uh, uh, mate, a contributor to your neighborhood's diversity, 
and somebody who's going to be in a little more proximity to you and therefore makes it a little easier for you to steal their ideas. If they come from far away, their ideas are going to be that much different from the ideas of the people you're surrounded with and therefore that much more valuable. There is uh, no question, and you know, people have done all sorts of very careful analyses of the costs and benefits of immigration. There is no question that Americans as a whole benefit far more from immigration than, than, than we suffer from it. Um, so sometimes your policy recommendation differs depending on where you are philosophically on something. Here's a case where fortunately we don't have to resolve the philosophical issue. Whether you think the government should be looking out for American uh, people only, or whether you think they should be looking out for the whole world, either way, our restrictive immigration policies are indefensible. Now, let's go a little further. Suppose you are a person who believes that the US government should be looking out only for $11 an hour American workers and not caring about anybody else. God knows where you came up with that philosophy, but suppose you did. Well, $11 an hour American workers are hurt by immigration. They're hurt a little bit, not a lot, but they're hurt a little bit. The $2 an hour Mexicans who are coming over here and making $9, they'll help to a hell of a lot. So now you face this question. All right, you've decided to care more about Americans than about foreigners, I'm not sure why. You've decided to care more about $11 an hour Americans than about any other Americans. I'm not sure why. But let me grant you all that. What you're doing is you're adopting a policy that's going to do these $11 an hour Americans a little bit of good at the expense of doing these $2 an hour Mexicans a huge amount of harm. And even if you care a whole lot more about the Americans than the Mexicans, there's still got to be some limit to how much harm you're willing to do the Mexicans before you'll, you'll, uh, in order to help the Americans. So you do some arithmetic on that, and I've done this. I've done the arithmetic. Um, and it turns out that to justify the immigration policies we've got, you would have to say, I value an American worker at least five times as much as I value a Mexican worker. In other words, you would have to say, I'm willing to do the Mexican $5 worth of harm in order to do the American $1 worth of good. And I ask you, I mean, what's, what's your cutoff? Certainly nobody would be willing to do them. I hope nobody would be willing to do the Mexican $1,000 worth of harm to do the American $1 worth of good. There's got to be some cutoff. $5 seems to me like it should be way over the cutoff. Uh, if you don't think so, then I, I got to ask you where your cutoff is and, and how you justify it. Um, this question. Of uh, the last question of the evening, uh, earlier in your comments, you mentioned uh, the um, the fear that we should have for granting government uh, the power to do good, uh, for fear of what they might do with that power. So, could you possibly uh, apply that to the ideas you've been talking about and expound? Well, upon it's that? a hard one. Look, the a lot of people feel squeamish. Uh, you know, if we could tell the promiscuous people from the cautious people, a lot of people feel kind of squeamish about a policy that says we should you know, pay uh, cautious people for having more partners. On the other hand, the argument for that really is exactly the same argument that we give for taxing polluters. Okay? Well, it works in reverse. In the one case, you're taxing a spillover cost. In the other case, you're subsidizing a spillover benefit. It's exactly the same argument. Okay? People tend not to feel squeamish about taxing the polluters. The first thing I would say is that if, if applying this argument in one area makes you feel squeamish, you should at least stop to ask about why it makes you feel squeamish and ask whether perhaps you should transfer some of those feelings to the other case. Um, governments can do a lot of good. They can do a lot of harm. The more power we give them to do good, the more power they're going to have to do harm. And it is a very, very difficult problem to um, uh, to resolve that conflict. I call myself a libertarian because I tend to come down uh, very much uh, on the side of saying uh, I would rather the government had less power to do good if it means they're going to have less power to do bad. Um, but there's no question they can do a lot of good and there's no question there are times when we want them doing good. I don't have a general rule for you about where to draw that. But let me, let me give you one example that, that really I think brings this this conflict into focus. 
I'm not sure how up to date this example is. It, it, uh, it may not be the case anymore, I'm not sure. But several years ago, auto insurance in Philadelphia cost about five times what it did in Pittsburgh. Same state, same regulatory agencies, same regulations, cities not too different in terms of crime and car theft and, 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 and traffic, et cetera, and you're paying five times as much for insurance in Philadelphia. Why is that? Because in Philadelphia, insurance was so expensive that a lot of people didn't buy it. You were required to buy it, but they didn't anyway. That meant there were a lot of uninsured motorists, a lot of people getting hit by uninsured motorists, and when you get hit by an uninsured motorist, your insurance picks up the tab. So the rates are really high. So the rates are really high because of all the uninsured motorists, and there are lots of uninsured motorists because the rates are really high. In Pittsburgh, the rates are low. Rates are low, everybody buys insurance, everybody buys insurance, no uninsured motorists, no reason for the rates to go up. Okay? Everybody in Pittsburgh is much happier than everybody in Philadelphia. Okay? And just by historical chance, they fell into these two very different patterns, and the patterns cannot break themselves. Okay? The government, by coming into Philadelphia and really enforcing an uninsured motorist law, could turn Philadelphia into Pittsburgh. That seems to me like something we probably want them doing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can see all kinds of reasons why you might be squeamish about granting the government that much power. Um, I don't know how to resolve that for you as a general rule. Anything else? I'm, I'm happy. Again, we, it doesn't have to be talk related. I'm happy to. Okay. Uh, if you're shy about talking here, we can talk in the restaurant.